Washington Shoe Factories, a Washington Historical Society presentation. At the beginning of the 20th century, Washington had a population of about 3,000. It had enjoyed prosperity since its founding as a river port and later a railroad town. Major items of commerce were local agricultural products and manufactured goods from craftsmen and merchants. With the collapse of the steamboat era and new competition from the ever-growing number of railroads, Washington's economy was stagnant and its per capita income in decline. In October 1906, the mayor and businessmen from Washington went to St. Louis to interview officials at the Roberts, Johnson, and Rand Shoe Company about building a factory in Washington. Their mission was well received. They were invited to inspect the Hannibal and St. Charles branch shoe factories. The Citizens Improvement Association of Washington appointed a committee to make visits. Members came home favorably impressed. A month later, the city signed an agreement with the company for a branch factory. Washington's competition included Anderson, Indiana, Carroll, Illinois, Cape Girardeau, and DeSoto. The plant site would be near the Tibby Electric Power Company on Front Street and close to the Missouri Pacific Railroad Yards. A $35,000 con contribution from the city was required. The shoe company promised to pay out $1 million in wages over the next 10 years. The Washington Citizen newspaper editor said the shoe company had a good deal for Washington. The city would pay the company $35,000 up front to build the plant, but that was only four cents for every $1 to be paid out in wages. To raise the $35,000, the Washington Finance and Shoe Factory Committee took options on land for potential home building lots for resale to the public. The factory would be built on the Elijah McLean estate tract on 2nd Street. New streets were laid out near the site, including three named for company owners Roberts, Rand, and Johnson. Most residential lots were to be sold located on these and other new streets nearby. Some lots were located elsewhere within city limits. All lots were at least 50 by 100 feet and priced at $200. By early 1907, 293 lots had been sold and were distributed to buyers. Profit was sufficient for the committee to pay the local contribution for the factory building project. A list of buyers was printed on the newspaper's front page. Persons of means were urged to build houses on their lots for prospective shoe factory workers, and if they could not afford to do so, to sell those lots at a profit to those who could. On February 12, 1907, a ceremony was held at the construction site marking the project's beginning. Elijah McLean's old home is in the background. The site for the factory and the surrounding acreage had been purchased from his estate. McLean once owned most of the western area of the town. His heirs were willing to sell much of that to the shoe factory committee, reserving a few acres around the McLean homestead. The three-story brick factory building was to be 50 feet wide and 250 feet long on an 18-inch concrete foundation. The engine room was on the west side and a 200-foot long basement on the east side. Workmen completed the foundation on March 22, 1907, and masons began laying the brick. Carpenters were engaged in laying the joists and setting the door and window frames. In May, the bricklayers completed their work and carpenters made preparations to lay the roof. The steam engine for the factory arrived on May 12th and the boilers and radiators arrived two weeks later. In little more than a half year, the building was almost completed. 
The factory was dedicated on the evening of June 21, 1907. The Washington Concert Band played for a public dance on the second floor. Music was an important part of Washington's cultural life, and celebrations of all kinds were usually accompanied with some lively music and very likely a keg of beer. The Citizen newspaper announced to the public on July 5th, 1907, that the building was completed and would soon be in production making shoes. As the building neared comp completion, some fear was expressed that Washington would not have enough houses to provide homes for factory employees who would locate here. In editorials and advertisements in the local newspapers, investors were urged to build housing for the workers. About the middle of June 1907, the Citizens Improvement Association began advertising for labor. At the same time, factory management moved to Washington. This parade float, pulled by Otto Schmidt's mules from Berger, helped make employment opportunities at the factory known to the public. The banner reads, Shoe Factory Needs More Girls Like These. The factory got into operation in short order in July. Superintendent Griffin Watkins stated that 500 persons would be employed eventually and daily output would be 3,500 pair of shoes. Shoe workers gathered around the main entrance doors for a photograph on a winter day not long after the factory opened. There was a shortage of houses in Washington. In editorials and advertisements, investors were implored to build more housing. Many bigger homes were remodeled into small, several small apartments, sometimes sharing bathrooms and other facilities. Some one-family houses became two-family homes. Some houses in other towns were taken down and rebuilt in Washington for factory workers. Some residents took in roomers and boarders who had jobs at the factory. On June 1914, Oscar Johnson, president of what was then known as the International Shoe Company, proposed a 50 by 165 foot addition to the factory to use to be for storing leather on the first floor and as a cutting room on the second. The original building was inadequate for production volume. The city's financial contribution was raised by the end of June. The Shoe and Finance Committee sold 45 fractional building lots left over from the first finance campaign to raise the money. In the cutting department, leather was cut into the component pieces. The Washington plant made heavy men's work shoes. Brands manufactured here were Star Brand, Friedman Shelby, Diamond Brand, and High Test Safety Shoes. The plant provided steady employment in six and a half years, it had already fulfilled its obligation to pay out the $1 million in wages promised for the first 10 years. This is a general view of the stitching department. In April 1917, after the U.S. entered World War I, International Shoe received a contract to make 250,000 pairs of shoes for the U.S. Army. Most shoes were made in Washington, keeping the factory very busy. Immediately, 500 people were employed, and soon over 5,000 pair a day were made. In September, the factory began to pay a 10% bonus on wages each month to all employees. Here is another view of the stitching department. The factory had a lot of women employees. In other factories, International made women's shoes under the brand names Trim Tread, Velvet Step, Grace Walker, Queen Quality, and Floorsheim Accent. Children's shoe brands included Red Goose, Paul Parrot, and Weatherbird. Skiving is a trimming process used to reduce thickness of upper parts before joining them. By 1945, International Shoe had become the largest shoe manufacturer in the United States. All factories were located in Missouri and Illinois, 
within a 200-mile radius of St. Louis. In World War II, the Washington plant made boots for the Army, Navy, and the Marines. This is the factory stockroom. Most shoes were shipped to St. Louis on the Missouri Pacific Railroad. Washington was the first town to have a shoe factory in Franklin County. By 1923, other county railroad towns that had branch shoe factories of companies headquartered in St. Louis were Union, New Haven, Pacific, St. Clair, and Sullivan. It is estimated that the county at that time was making 2 million pairs of shoes a year. When more space was, was needed at the factory in 1923, another civic committee was organized to raise $10,000 to finance a second addition. This was to be a one-story building, 42 by 220 feet, which would enable the company to employ 300 more men and women. At the close of January, 98 local firms and citizens had contributed the $10,000. The building was completed in May that year. When the due edition was ready, advertisements appeared in local papers offering jobs at International. The ad reads, the new edition of the Washington branch of the International Shoe Company's factory has been completed and we need immediately additional help. Steady employment will be given 52 weeks in the year liberal pay to beginners and rapid advancement. Washington is one of the fastest growing cities in Missouri. And if you're looking for work, here's your chance. A big shoe factory constantly increasing can advance you more rapidly than the smaller factories. Four other smaller additions were made to the plant in 1918, 1929, and 1947. At that time, it had an outside area of 131,000 square feet. In the first 50 years, the Washington factory paid out a total of $55 million in wages, and daily output in 1947 was 7,560 pairs. At peak production, it employed as many as 12,000 workers. Factory employees gather across 2nd Street from the main entrance during a fire drill in the early 1950s. The homes pictured further down the street are typical of the houses that many workers occupied. They were built on lots sold in 1907 to help finance the original factory building, also in the photo. Approximately 150 homes were constructed on the streets close to the plant. The predominating styles of the dwellings include the Pyramid Square, American Four Square, and the Bungalow. International shoe workers were involved in civic affairs at all levels in Washington. This float was the factory's entry in Washington's Centennial Parade in 1939. The factory was located one block from Washington City Park and the baseball diamond. Stronger than the law was the International Shoe Baseball Team. It was named for one brand of men's work shoes. Posed outside the factory is the shoe company's band from the early days. Washington was noted for its many skilled musicians and many civic marching bands. International had one of the biggest bands in town. This air view of the Washington factory was included in the company's 1947 annual report. At the close of 1947, the entire company employed 35,000 men and women, an increase of 3,000 during the year. In its 55 shoe factories, the company had produced 54 million pair of shoes, representing 11% of all shoes produced in the United States. It owned nine tanneries, a rubber plant producing rubber soles and heels, and a large cotton mill. Wages were up and workers received two additional paid holidays. The company had 25,000 retailers in all states and territories, and three million pair had been sold abroad. 
1947 was a banner year, and the management was looking forward to a better year in 1948. Many good years followed after that, but bad times were ahead. International Shoe closed its Washington factory on March 24, 1960. It had been Washington's biggest employer since 1907, but production had been slowing for years. Officials said the cost of production was too high. Imports eventually drove the company from the shoe business entirely. After the factory closed, various parts of the plant were rented as warehouse space. Many people had worked at the factory for most of their lives and knew no other kind of work. Some found employment at big new industries near St. Louis, such as the McDonald Aircraft Corporation and the Chrysler Assembly Plant. Some people moved from Washington. Loss of the factory accelerated civic action on industrial development. In the more than 50 years since its closing, many new industries located in Washington through the efforts of the Chamber of Commerce, the city, the state, the Small Business Administration, and other development entities. In the 1920s boom time, Washington's other shoe factory came to town. In November 1924, the Four Shoe Company of St. Louis opened a factory in Washington on East 5th Street. The company requested that the city of Washington purchase $10,000 in stock, give them a site, and construct a building. The Washington Chamber of Commerce, newly organized in 1923, raised funds to assist the Four plant. In 1927, an addition was added to the building with local assistance. The company soon changed its name to the Washington Shoe Company and continued with that name until 1929 when Kane, Dunham, and Krauss purchased the company. KDK had 130 workers in 1929. It grew fast. In 1930, 245 employees worked overtime and all day on Saturdays. Production was on the rise at Washington Shoe Factories in 1934. International employed 1,500 and KDK more than 450 workers. Because Washington had a high level of employment in the shoe industry, the Great Depression of the 1930s made less of an impact on the town than the rest of the nation. Washington staged a great celebration in 1939 to mark its 100th birthday. Like many other businesses and institutions in town, KDK entered the parade with this float, Cobbler's Workshop. The float is waiting on East 3rd Street near Hooker Street for the parade to begin. During the 1930s and the 40s, KDK, International, and the shoe factories located in Union held annual beauty pageants complete with floats and formally attired contestants. In September 1948, Alice Holdmeyer, International Shoe Company employee, was crowned Shoe Queen of Franklin County at the Washington City Park. In 1946, a major strike against KDK greatly weakened the business and in 1949, the factory closed. The Chamber of Commerce offered an incentive of $60,000 to entice a new industry into the empty building. The Deb Shoe Company responded and opened in the KDK building in May 1950 under the ownership of the Wolf Shoe Company of St. Louis. The company made fashionable ladies' dress shoes sold under the Deb brand name. The Deb Shoe Factory closed in September 1971. Economic conditions were blamed, leading to shoe imports. The parent company also closed its shoe factory at Raleigh. After Deb closed, the building was occasionally used for storage and other purposes. The water tower structure was adapted for use as a cell phone tower. In 2005, 
application was made to shoot, place the Deb Shoe Building on the National Register of Historic Places. The application's narrative summary of, of that said of the building's integrity of location, design, setting, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association has been retained. The application was successful. Status on the register made the owner eligible for extensive tax credits to refurbish the building for new uses. After securing national register status, the owner spent several years redeveloping the property for use as a senior residential center. MacArthur Park Senior Living Center opened in January 2008.